Okay. If you would open up to John chapter 18, John chapter 18, and uh, while you find that passage, my clock's already running, so I want to get started quickly. Uh, over here on the table, there are some things from our ministry. The first thing is just a, a little flyer about our Bible conference. Uh, Grace Life Bible Church is hosting a Bible conference October 21st through the 23rd in Michigan. Uh, at the church there, the, the topic this year is a continuation of last year's topic on the issue of grace in our culture. And our speakers this year are myself, Brother Ted Fellows, and Brother Alex Kurz. They're going to be coming out and joining us. And then I also just wanted to say there's some books and literature on the, on the table back there from our ministry. Uh, one of the booklets that is back there is called Truth Versus Tolerance. And this expands upon some of the things that I'm going to have time to talk with you about uh, in this hour. So if you're interested... This is back there. It's $2 or some other things back there if you're interested. If you would, John chapter 18, the assignment that I've been given this morning is to talk about uh, the title of my message is, Is Absolute Truth Absolutely Necessary? Okay? And the answer is yes. We can all go have lunch now. Okay? Um, But I'm supposed to talk to you about a study of the nature and meaning of absolutes and how to be absolutely sure what you believe is absolutely true. I've enjoyed the, the study so far this morning, and it's been interesting to me knowing I was going to go last this morning to kind of see how all of these studies have built upon each other. And I do want to thank Ed Yarber uh, in particular for confirming something to me that I always sort of suspected but could never really prove, and that is that the state of Ohio has got to be the most pagan state in the Union, okay? <laughs> so uh, those of you that are familiar with the disputes between Michigan and Ohio, you'll know what I'm talking about, Okay. Let's read John chapter 18, John chapter 18, verse 38. (laughs) John chapter 18, verse 38. Pilate said unto him, what is truth? Dearly Father, thank you for this opportunity that we have to study together. For the men of the week who have put together their messages, for the saints that have come out to hear them preach and to hear the word of God go forth, we pray this will be a time of edification for all. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Pilate here asks the Lord Jesus Christ in this context the question that philosophers and and so forth have been asking for centuries. When he says this statement here in verse 38, Pilate said unto him, what is truth? Now, we're not going to read the rest of that verse because that's really all I'm after there. But the question of what is truth, this is a a question of of an exorbitantly profound nature that has been puzzling people for a very long time. Much debate has taken place over what the issue of truth is. And I don't know about you, but when I read Pilate's statement there, it's almost seething with sarcasm, okay? Oh, yeah, well, what is truth? As if there is no such thing as truth or something along those lines. And as Richard said uh, a moment ago, our culture is steeped in a great deal of relativism. And I'll explain to you what that is in a minute. But I want to start off by just giving you some practical things to think about. Americans, folks, are fickle when it comes to the issue of the truth, all right? On the one hand, we demand the truth from our spouses, children, bosses, doctors, bankers, stockbrokers, lawyers, and politicians, okay? People expect to be told the truth when reading reference books, pill bottles, road signs, food labels, and watching news stories. In fact, Americans demand the truth in almost every facet of their lives that affects their money, their relationships, their safety, or their health, okay? So there's this great outcry to have the truth. But then when it comes to the issue of religion and morality, then all of a sudden, we don't want the truth anymore. Then all of a sudden, the truth, whether it's absolute, doesn't matter anymore, okay? Why is it when it comes to the issues of religion and morality is truth relative and or individually determined when they would never accept that standard in any of those other categories that I just mentioned a moment ago, okay? you'll hear people say things like, well, that's true for you, but it's not true for me. And the idea is that truth is determined by what you believe, okay? So you make things true by choosing to believe them. Uh, it's very disheartening to me. I work in a public high school, and I, I teach a, a, a introduction to philosophy class in that high school, and I have Christian students in my classroom who will tell me that Christianity is true because they choose to believe it. So it's got nothing to do with the truth claims of Christianity. It's true in their mind simply because they choose to believe it. Okay, and we'll address some of those things later on. I used to do a, um, an assignment in, with my students where they would have to write a paper about ethics and morality. I, I still do that, but I've changed a little bit. 
And this student, this, this female student, she wrote me a paper one time, and their whole paper was arguing how all moral truth is totally relative and totally subjective. Okay, that was what she was arguing to me in the paper. So I took her paper and I read it, and I wrote on it, F, I don't like black ink, and gave it back to her. She was mad. <laughs> Boy, I, I've never had a student more mad. And she carried on for about five minutes, and finally I said to her, are you done now? And she said, yeah. And I said, based upon what you've argued in this paper, can you please tell me how I've treated you unfairly? She could. I took the paper, I scratched off the F, and I gave her the grade that I'd really given her in the grade book. But the point is, there was a teaching moment there that I had with that student. And that student, I saw, I ran into her, by the way, some years later, and she remembered that. I was, I was happy about that. So in order to address my topic this morning, I want to cover basically four points, okay? The first point is I want to spend some time talking about inadequate views of truth. Then I want to talk second about the correspondence view of truth. Third, I want to talk about the issue of thy word is truth. And then fourth, given how much time we have left, I want to give you some concluding sort of thoughts and practical conversational tips for how to kind of talk to people about these issues out there when you're going to encounter them. So getting into the first point right away is the issue of, of inadequate views of truth. Go, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 3. Go get Proverbs chapter 3. Now, there are a bunch of inadequate views of truth that we could cover, and we just don't have time to do it. So I selected three that I think are the most prevalent, the most uh, uh, common that you're probably going to run into, okay? And the first one is what Richard said is the issue of relativism. Relativism, relativism is the idea that truth is individually determined, that each person determines for themselves what truth is, okay? Simply stated, relativism is the belief that there is no such thing as absolute truth. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to be Carl Sagan. Where's Matt at? You don't have to be Carl Sagan to figure out what is wrong with the statement there's no such thing as absolute truth. In just uttering the statement, am I making an absolute statement about truth? So that is what we call a self-defeating argument, right? If I say there's no such thing as absolute truth, am I claiming to know absolutely that there's no such thing as absolute truth? So you need to understand that that argument on a surface, before you go to any verse, before you need to look at any scripture, it doesn't make any sense, okay? It just doesn't work as a philosophical position or a position that you want to take on truth. Not to mention the fact the Word of God would say you don't want to think about it that way, okay? In a recent survey, they, they concluded that 81% of teenagers view truth as relative. Okay, 81% of teenagers view truth as relative. They asked the same questions to so supposedly church or Christian young people, and the numbers came back only slightly better at 71%. Okay, 71% of Christian young people believe truth is relative according to this particular survey. Now, when you think about relativism, look at Proverbs chapter 3, look at verse 7. Proverbs chapter 3, I'm in Job, that's not going to work. Proverbs chapter 3, excuse me, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7. Be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from what? If I'm going to adopt the position that truth is relative and I get to determine what's true for me, am I violating that verse? That verse would speak against the issue of relativism, and as are a whole bunch more. Come to Proverbs 12. Come over to Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. Notice what it says here. It says, the way of a what? Of a fool is right in his own what? So if I'm going to adopt a position that truth is individually determined, who is the final authority in making that determination? The individual, right? The Bible would say, and it does teach here, and there's a bunch more verses we're not going to go to because we don't have time and I want to get through the points. The Bible over and over and over again says that men did what was right in their own what? 
in their own eyes. And the Scripture calls that thinking, that, that relativistic thinking of doing what's true in your own eyes, it calls it foolishness, okay? It calls it not something that you want to sort of be involved in. So as it turns out, the challenge of relativism is easily answered because, number one, you have ample verses from the Word of God to tell you that that kind of thinking is not sound. But also, you have the very fact that if anybody's going to argue for relativism, the argument defeats itself. Okay? You ever notice how, you ever notice how agnostics are not agnostic about their agnosticism? Do you ever notice how skeptics are not skeptical of their skepticism? Okay? Because these, these, these positions that are contrary to the Scripture don't work. Come over to Daniel chapter 5, the second inadequate view of truth. Go to Daniel chapter 5. <coughs> the second inadequate view of truth is called pragmatism. Pragmatism holds that truth is what works. So if it works, it's true. If it doesn't work, it's what? It's not true, okay? Many people believe that truth is found in utility or usefulness or whether or not something works. So in other words, uh, in other words, knowing is something we do and is best seen as a practical activity. Questions of meaning and truth are also understood in this context. Look at Belshazzar here in Daniel chapter 5. Now, I'm not going to teach this whole passage because we don't have time to do that, but in the context of the passage here, Daniel has taken, or Belshazzar has taken all the, all the uh, things out of the tabernacle, out of the temple from Jerusalem, and he's having a party, right? And in the middle of the party, the hand of God shows up on the wall and writes this, and writes this message, right? Uh, you, you see that if you, uh, if, if you look at the passage. And Belshazzar is all freaked out, and he brings in all the magicians, the soothsayers. He brings in all these guys to, to tell them what it means and what it says, right? And does any of it work? Only then does he do what? Only then does he, does he bring Daniel. Look at verse 16. Well, look at verse 15 first, uh, Daniel 5, verse 15. And now these wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read the writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof, but they could not show the interpretation of the thing. So does the wisdom of the world work in interpreting what God's doing in this case? No, right? Only then do they bring in who? Look at the next verse, verse 16. And I heard of thee that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed in scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck, and thou, shalt be the, and thou shalt be the third ruler in the kingdom. My point here is this. When does Belshazzar uh, bother to consult Daniel? When nothing else, what? Works. Would doing it God's way have worked from the beginning? Okay, so this idea, this pragmatic idea that truth is what works, that's common out there in the culture is, again, contrary to the word of God. Folks, think about it for a minute. Can you often get what you want by telling lies? Do lies work in bringing about the outcome often that you want to see happen? Yeah, they are pragmatic in that way in doing that, right? Lies often work. But their effectiveness doesn't make them what? True. The lie might work in bringing about whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish, but just because you got what you accomplished doesn't make what you lied about what? True. Okay? 5 plus 5 equals 10, not because it works, but because it's correct. That's why. And the third view inadequate view of truth is subjectivism. Subjectivism is the idea that truth is what feels good. You ever heard this? Okay. Supporters of this view argue that truth is what provides a satisfying feeling while error is what feels bad. Thus, truth is found in our subjective feelings according to this form of subjectivism. I'm going to do this thing, and, and being around high school students, I see this kind of thing all the time. If it were wrong then it wouldn't feel what? It wouldn't feel good. I wouldn't get enjoyment out of it. And the fact that it feels good and I get enjoyment out of it and, it, and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but the fact that it feels good, that subjective opinion, therefore, means it's what? Means it's true according to subjectivism. So 
The problem with this, and there are many, is, is it true that bad news can make you feel bad? Somebody comes in and says, you know, so-and-so died in a car accident or whatever, or so-and-so has this disease or whatever, and it makes you feel what? Bad, but because you feel bad, you don't doubt whether or not it's what? Whether or not it's true, just because it makes you feel bad, okay? There's the old saying, truth what? Truth hurts, right? Uh, That movie, A Few Good Men with Jack Nicholson, and what's the famous line from that movie? You want the truth, you can't what? You can't handle the truth. Right? So we, we're familiar with these, with these views, okay? So all of these views, whether you're talking about relativism, whether you're talking about pragmatism, or whether you're talking about subjectivism, all of these views ultimately, in the end, do they not claim or assume to correspond with reality? Okay? There's a certain assumption there. Thereby they assume or presuppose what, what I'm going to call here in the next point, a correspondence view of truth, right? So that mo- moving now into the correspondence view of truth as my second point. Simply stated, folks, truth is telling it like it is. That's what truth is, okay? In other words, truth is what corresponds with its referent. And therefore, truth is what presents the way things really are. It does not matter if one is discussing abstract or actual realities or mathematical or theoretical ideas. Truth is what accurately expresses its referent, okay? So I hear a smack coming from the upstairs bedrooms and a blood-curdling scream, right? And I say, what's going on? My youngest son says, he smacked me with a lightsaber. Did you smack your brother with a lightsaber? No. I didn't smack him with a lightsaber. Then why does he have this big red welt across his face? Right? When he says, I didn't do it, I didn't smack him with a lightsaber, and if he in fact did, we call that what? We call that lying. Why do we call that lying? We call that lying because it doesn't accurately report the state of affairs, at whatever they may be. Okay? So as you think about these things, and it, it doesn't matter what you're discussing, in short, Truth is what correctly depicts the state of affairs, whatever they might be. Go over to Exodus chapter 20 with me. Go over to Exodus chapter 20. And while you're turning there, I just want to make a couple more points about this. Go over to Exodus chapter 20. So, if truth is telling it like it is, what's falsehood? Falsehood would be telling it like it's not. Okay? Falsehood, then, is that which does not correspond to its object and therefore misrepresents the way things actually are. Okay? And it doesn't matter what one's intentions or beliefs are. That is inconsequential, right? If a statement lacks, and the lawyer here can tell me, tell you if I'm right about this, but if a statement lacks proper correspondence, we say it is a false what? Now, if, if I say to you, Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead... I don't believe that, but if I made that statement, how many of you would buy that? Why, do you, why would you not believe that? The reason you would not believe that is because you believe in actual fact that Jesus Christ did what? Rise from the dead, okay? So it doesn't matter how strongly one believes it. It doesn't matter what their own personal, private, subjective opinion is. If what they're saying does not correspond with the way things actually are, it's not what? It's not truth, right? So there are a host of things that we could talk about. Just briefly mentioning three. Um, Views of truth, non-correspondence views of truth are self-defeating. One one cannot deny the correspondence view of truth without using it in its attempted denial. Number two, uh, correspondence views of truth make lying impossible. Look Look at the verse here, Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, look at verse 16. Thou shalt not bear what? False witness against thy what? What's false witness? False witness is you say they did something that they didn't really what? That they didn't really do, right? So if, if truth does not correspond to its referent, if I, if I accuse my neighbor of stealing ten pigs, and he didn't really steal ten pigs, what am I doing? 
I'm, I'm lying. If I tell three other guys, hey, my neighbor st- uh, stole 10 pigs, now I'm bearing false witness against my what? Against my neighbor, right? So true, if, if there's no such thing as truth and truth doesn't correspond to its referent, then there's no such thing as lying. Because that would mean anybody could say anything at any time and it would all be what? It would all be true, okay? Third, as I just said and alluded to, non-correspondence views of truth lead to the breakdown of factual conversation. Okay? They lead to the breakdown of factual conversation. By factual, factual conversation, I mean factual communication depends on informative statements. But informative statements must be factually true in order to inform one correctly. Okay? If facts are not to be used in evaluating a statement, then one hasn't really said anything at all. You guys following that? Let's look at a few more passages here. Come with me to Genesis 42. Go over to Genesis chapter 42. Genesis chapter 42 Look with me at verse 14. Genesis chapter 42, verse 14. And Joseph said unto them, this is the situation here is that his brothers, he's, he's found out his brothers are alive. You know that they did him wrong and sold him into slavery and did all this stuff to him, right? Notice, notice what he says here. They've, they've made a report to him. Verse 14, and Joseph said unto them, that, that is it that I spake unto you, saying, ye are spies. What is Joseph accusing them of? Spies. Okay. Are they really spies? Well, how are we going to figure this out? Look at verse 15. Hereby ye shall be what? Proved. What does it mean when he says ye shall be proved? He's going to test whether or not the story that they're giving them is actually what? True and factual, okay? Verse 15, whereby ye, sh- whereby ye shall be proved, by the life of Pharaoh ye shall not go from hence, except your youngest brother come hither. Send one of you and let him fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison. Notice, now watch this, that your words may be what? Proved whether they whether there be any truth where. So have they told have they told Joseph some information? Is Joseph skeptical whether or not they're telling him the truth? And by the way, given his history in dealing with his brothers, does he have good reason to be skeptical? Okay. So he devises a way to determine whether or not the story that they're telling him is in line and in accordance with the actual what? facts that they are representing and so he says i'm going to send put all you guys in prison i'm going to send one of you home you're going to go home you're going to fetch your younger brother you're going to bring him here and i'm going to know whether or not you're telling me what the truth okay a um, lot of verses here uh go to acts 5 go to acts chapter 5 ananias and sapphira They tell one thing, they misrepresent their situation, (laughs) Acts chapter 5, verse 1, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold the possession, now watch, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So did they sell their land? They sold it, right? They got this amount, and then they bring a smaller amount, and they say, here's what we got for what? For the land, right? So were they accurately representing the facts? Verse 3, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie? What does he call that? Lying. Why does what Satan hath filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Notice, and to keep back part of the price of the land. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thy own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing where? 
Uh, that tells you a lot about the situation, right? Why do people want to accept relativism or pragmatism or subjectivism and not accept a correspondence view of truth? Because if there is such a thing as proper correspondence, then that means everybody's a dirty, rotten dog and everybody's done wrong. And that's, isn't that what the lost want? They want to escape accountability? Okay? And so the Bible is defining truth in a very specific way. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Let's look at what Paul says about this quickly. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. He says, wherefore, putting away what? Lying. So lying is something Paul says you need to what? You need to put it away, right? And then he says, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man what? Now, do you see what Paul just did? Paul just juxtaposed lying with what? Truth. What is truth? Truth is telling it like it is, right? Truth is accurately representing the state of affairs. What is lying? Lying is not doing that. Lying is in any way short of telling it like it actually is. Ananias and Sapphira get in trouble in Acts 5 because they misrepresent the facts. They don't tell the truth about what happened there with their, their selling of that particular piece of property. So, so far we've looked at three inadequate views of truth. We've looked at the issue of relativism, pragmatism, and subjectivism. Second, I've tried to, conv I've tried to convey to you that the Bible's definition of truth is, is, is found in the idea of correspondence, that something is true if, when it corresponds with its referent, and if it doesn't, we call that what? We call that lying, we call that false witness, and last, not, not last, almost last, I'm running out of time, quick, go to John 17. Go to John chapter 17. We want to look at the idea that the word is truth. Folks, there is an absolute authority, okay? There is an absolute truth. The absolute truth that, that, that is out there is found, number one, in a book, and number two, in a person, okay? It's found in a book, and it's found in a person. Pilate, we started this sermon by looking at Pilate. Pilate raises the question in John 15, and he says, what is truth, right? He asks that question. Jesus indirectly sort of answers that. John 17, 17, he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is what? Truth. So, where is the truth? Where is absolute truth found? Number one, absolute truth is found where? It's found in a book, right? It's found in the scripture. Think about 2 Timothy 2.15. I know all of, the, all of you could quote that, right? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, doing what? Rightly dividing the word of what? Is everything in this Bible true? You, when we rightly divide, we don't divide truth from error. We divide truth from truth right? We divide truth that God had spoken to the nation of Israel in time past through the prophets from another category or type of truth that God kept secret since the world began and revealed it when he made known the mystery, okay? So we understand that truth, absolute truth, is found in a book and that that book, if you're going to understand the truth for you, it needs to be rightly divided. So it almost sounded too relative there. If you're going to understand the truth, you need to have the truth, and you need to rightly divide the truth, okay? But truth is also found in a person. Go to John 14. John chapter 14. John chapter 14, <clears throat> verse 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and what? The life. The same thing that Christ says about the book, he says about who? Himself, right? Those of you that have gone through Grace School of Bible, you understand from manuscript evidence that God's design and inspiration is to make the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, equal with what? 
with the written word, right? We understand those things. So the truth is not just, absolute truth is not just found in the scripture. It's found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by who? Me. We don't have time to get into it, folks, but the Lord Jesus Christ and God Almighty puts his integrity on the line in his word, okay? And he, the way you know that, well, we do need to look at it. Go to Isaiah 46. Go to Isaiah 46 quickly. We know that Paul says in Titus chapter 1, God cannot what? Lie, right? We know in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, that it says God is not a man that he should what? That he should lie. Isaiah chapter 46. See, God puts his own integrity on the line when he attributes his own attributes to his word and he tells you in advance what's going to happen through the issue of predictive prophecy. Because if God... If God prophesies something that's not true, then did he just lie about it? And if he lied about it, could we say that he is the truth? No. Isaiah chapter 46, Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9. It says here, remember the former things of old, for I am who? I am God, and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Here it is, verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my what? Folks, if God Almighty in the Old Testament says that his son is going to be born in Bethlehem, then where does he need to be born? Bethlehem, right? If God Almighty says that, uh, you know, I don't care. Anything is going to happen. And he says it in advance of it happening. Is God putting his own integrity on the line? And the issue of fulfilled prophecy is the greatest single divine apologetic to the absolute truthfulness of the word of God. And thereby also the reality that Jesus Christ is the what? Is the truth. So in other words, folks, the Bible then is absolutely true because it corresponds with reality and doesn't report anything to you that's false. If, you know that archaeologists and historians and so forth have never unearthed anything out of the soil of this earth that has ever disproved any biblical reference. Not one time. So if the Bible can be validated to be true in all that it reports against extra-biblical extra information through the internal witness of fulfilled prophecy, through something I don't have time to get into, but I wish I did, called undesigned coincidences in the Scripture, if the Bible can be proven to be true extra-biblically, internally, then is it worthy to be believed in what it says about spiritual things? Okay? So most religions... Now here's where I've got to make some decisions about how I want to use my last 12 minutes. Most religions have some beliefs that are true. How many of you are familiar with this idea that, God, that you know, life is sort of this mountain and God's at the top and all the paths lead up to the mountain of God? How many of you are fulfilled with that or know about that? Well, in some sense, at the bottom of this mountain, do all the religions generally say that lying and murder and adultery and things like that are bad? But as you kind of walk your way up the top of this mountain or toward the top of this mountain with God at the top, eventually what you do is you run into competing beliefs. You run into beliefs that are competing against each other. For example, what do you believe about Jesus Christ? How many of you in here believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the second member of the Godhead, incarnate in human flesh? How many of you believe that? Does Islam believe that? No, Islam doesn't believe that. So let me ask you a question. Can Islam and Christianity both be correct? Why not? Because they're teaching opposites. You ever try to take the same ends of a magnet and put them together? What happens? They, 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 they want to they wanna repel each other, right? So contrary beliefs, you need to understand this, contrary beliefs are possible, but contrary truths are not possible. Say that again. Contrary beliefs are possible, but contrary truths are not possible. In short, we can believe everything is true, but we can't make everything true. 
Brother Reed, I'm very glad you sat here in the front because I was going to use you for an illustration. <laughs> Brother Reed can believe that he is Brutus the Buckeye. Okay? He can believe this sincerely. He could be willing to die for his belief that he's Brutus the Buckeye. That's the Ohio State mascot, okay? He can, he can hold this to the point that he's willing to die for it. But does the fact that he believes that make it true? No. For all the reasons we've gone over here, right? So many have said that knowledge then equals properly justified true belief. Okay, let me explain what that means. So I shoot a, if I'm playing basketball and I shoot a basket, what's the objective? To score a basket and make two points, right? Every time I shoot a basket, do I score? No, if I was, I'd be in the NBA, right? Okay. So the same thing is true in the realm of belief. Do we believe things that are not true? Hopefully we don't. We don't want to think that. But do, how many of you think you're infallible? Okay. My point is, to know, to know something starts with the first you have to what? You have to believe it, right? But then in order for you to know it, you second, what you believe has to be what? have to be true. If it's not true, it's, if it's not a true belief, it's, it doesn't equal what? It doesn't equal knowledge. And third, it has to have what we call proper justification. And the reality, folks, is that the Word of God has ample internal evidence, the issue of fulfilled prophecy. It has the issue of undesigned coincidences or unintentional marks of authenticity. It has external evidence in the realm of archaeology and geography. It has external evidence in the realm of history. It has external evidence in the realm of manuscript evidence. And so the belief, my belief that the Word of God is the, time, the, the, the absolute of final authority has proper justification, more so than anything else out there. I am more willing to live with the things that I don't fully understand because I am convinced that the things that I do believe are what? True. This guy says to me one time, so what you have to deal with here in the end, folks, is that the Bible's truth claims are absolute and exclusive. If Christianity is right, then everything else out there is what? Wrong. I'm going to go a step further. If mid-Acts Pauline dispensationalism is right, then that means any dispensational position that does not agree with it is what? Is wrong. Okay? So, guy says to me, an acquaintance recently, the trouble with you, Ross, is that you think you're right. Duh. How many people do you know that go and believe things that they know are wrong. Okay? So I said to the guy, uh, let me get back here. I said to the guy, then that must mean that, that, then that must mean that you think I'm wrong. And the guy said to me, yeah, I think you're wrong. So I said to him, what, should I, what would I need to do then to be right? Would I need to agree with you? Oh, yeah. What are you mad at me for then? Because you think you're just as right as I am. See, generally speaking, people are most, generally speaking, most rational people don't believe things that they know are false. They believe them because they think they're right which means that everyone you will ever deal with regarding truth is just as close-minded as you, they accuse you of being. Okay? In order for you to be right in their eyes, you have to agree with who? So they're all mad at you for, for being exclusive in your belief, yet in order for you to be right, you have to agree with who? Folks, listen, atheism. If the atheism is correct, then theism is what? God cannot exist and not exist at the same time. He can't. Okay? So the atheist is going to get all mad at you, a theist, for believing that God exists and say, ah, oh, you're too dogmatic, you're too close-minded, you're too fundamental. Ooh. Meanwhile, what's their position? 
They're too dogmatic. They're too close-minded. They're too fundamental the other way around. Tell an atheist that they're a fundamentalist. They'll really get mad at you. I was minding my own, my own business one day in the lunchroom at school, and this a colleague of mine, a science teacher, came in. And he, I don't know, in front of the whole, the whole teaching staff, he looks at me and he says the following. He says, Ross, don't you know that science is the only source of absolute truth? He calls me out in front of the whole lunch group. And I'm like, oh. So I just keep eating. And I'm sort of thinking, what am I going to say? And I can feel everybody's eyes like, you know. <laughs> and all I, after a pause and kind of figure out what I was going to say, all I said to the guy was this. I turned to him and I said, can you prove that to me scientifically? And he got up and left. <laughs> the point is, when he said, Science is the only source of absolute truth. Again, he was engaging in a circular reasoning because he can't prove that supposition using science. He was making a philosophical, logical supposition. So, folks, when we're engaged in these conversations with lost people regarding the nature of truth, what we need to do is we need to pay attention, okay? And we need to be aware of the things they're saying that don't make sense. And you need to be able to learn how to navigate through these things. Now, in conclusion, I just want to, I'm really going to only have time to scratch the surface of this. My assignment, my topic was to address, again, the nature and meaning of absolutes and how to be absolutely sure what you believe is absolutely true. I am personally fully persuaded that the Word of God possesses absolute authority. And my conviction is based upon the abundance of internal and external evidences discussed above. The truth must be absolute because it is the only position that is logically, cons logically consistent and does not defeat itself. Okay? Think about this with me. Either God exists or he what? Doesn't. Okay? Either the word of God is true or it's what? Not. Either Jesus Christ was the son of God or he what? Or he wasn't, okay? Either Jesus rose from the dead, or he what? Or he didn't. Either Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, ooh, or he isn't. Either God set Israel aside, or he what? Or he didn't. Either God, either we must needs be circumcised, or circumcision availeth what? Nothing. Either the mystery was kept secret since the world began, or it wasn't. Um, here's one. Either Israel had already fallen and was already being diminished when Paul wrote Romans 11, or they weren't. Some of you get the significance of that. So, folks, what I think we need to realize here is that every time you work your way through one of those questions, what you're doing is you're you're narrowing your options every time you answer that to what the truth is. You understand that? Folks, we as mid-acts polling dispensationalists, we use, whether we realize it or not, whether we want to admit it or not, we utilize this type of, this type of logical reasoning every time we teach this chart. Because we say what God did over here isn't what he's doing where? Here. And if what he said here means anything and is different from that, then they can't be what? The same. Okay? So Acts 2 or Acts 28, dispensationalists may attempt to cry foul on this conclusion. But the details of... I'm going I'm to hit this and I'm just going to go two minutes, I promise. Okay? How do I turn this off? Stop. There he goes. Stop. Acts 2 and Acts 28, dispensationalists may attempt to cry foul on this conclusion... But there are details of those positions, folks, that defy logic. For the Acts 2 position to be correct, prophecy, right here in, uh, in Acts 2, prophecy would have to become mystery. Moreover, the last days of prophecy would have to become the beginning of the body of Christ, if that position is true. Moreover, no, I'm sorry, similarly... Problems exist for supporters of the Acts 28 position. Paul writes to the Corinthians about the body of Christ, 
about being in the body of Christ prior to penning the prison epistles after Acts 28. If the body of Christ did not begin until after Acts 28, then one is left with the bizarre conclusion that there were members in the body of Christ before the body of Christ began. Does that make any sense? No. So, you know, if, if, somebody, has, if somebody has hypoglycemia, what does that mean? It means their blood sugar is what? It's low, right? Hypo means lack of deficiency, right? This acts to position, you know what this is? That's hypo-dispensationalism. That's not enough dividing. That's not enough dispensationalism. This acts to position out here, this acts 28 position out here, you know what that is? That's hyper what? Dispensationalism. That's too much what? Dividing. You know where the truth is? The truth is that sweet spot right in the middle. That the dispensation of grace, the church, the body of Christ, began with the salvation of who? You're not under-dividing, you're not what? You're not over-dividing. So if sound reasoning is important to your belief system, look no further than the mid-Acts Pauline position. Okay? In my opinion, it is the only theological viewpoint that consistently applies the, the fundamental laws of logic, and it is time for us to recognize it and understand it. I am absolutely persuaded that what I believe is absolutely true. In fact, I'm willing to assert that when one combines our position on the Bible with our mid ex Pauline dispensational position, second, and third, along with the practical principles and issues of the grace life, what we establish is an impregnable fortress of truth. Okay? That is unassailable. And I do believe... An absolute truth, and I will just end with this comment. What you want to do, folks, is you want to pitch a doctrinal tent, not build a permanent structure. Because none, because as we learn things further through study, we can pick that tent up and what? Move it if we need to, and we're not sitting there defending a permanent structure that we don't need to defend. Generally, Father, thank you for your word. We're grateful for your truth, the truth found in the word of God itself and in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're grateful for our understanding of dispensational truth and reality. We pray that we'll have clarity on these issues. We're grateful for the saints that have uh, patiently listened to the teaching this morning. And we pray for the teaching that's yet to come. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.